For many years now, a certain question has kept me up at night, just as it's kept up many greater minds than mine. The question is this. Who would win in a fight between Ricky Gervais, but he has no arms or ability to laugh? <laughs> or Stephen Fry, but he can't speak Latin or exercise his divine charm? Oh, sh <laughs> no, I jest, of course. This is an easy question to answer, as the comments below reveal. Rather, the question that's kept me up at night is, why is there something rather than nothing? And I'm not talking nothing in the Lawrence Krauss sense of actually kind of something, as is embodied in the mantra, nothing is unstable. Sure, it might be the case that virtual particles and space-time bubbles will spontaneously come into existence from a quantum vacuum, but that's not the question that I, at least, want answered. No, what I want to know is why is there even a quantum vacuum at all? Why are there any dimensions, any reasons, any god? Why is there anything at all? Why not nothing? This query has been called the fundamental question of metaphysics, and famously, Bertrand Russell's response was to say that there is no reason whatsoever, stating, I should say that the universe is just there and that's all. It's a brute fact, a fact that exists for no reason. This, no doubt, is an extremely unsatisfying response. I mean, what would you think of me if I said there's no explanation for why I created this video? You'd think I'm talking nonsense, right? There's always a reason. Indeed, at all costs, we don't want a brute fact in our worldview, as it's extremely ontologically expensive. But what if I told you that just like Russell, you too have a brute fact in your worldview, or worse? If, like Russell, you're well aware of this, then you're probably smiling. But if you're not aware of this, or better yet, if you're calling bull, then strap in, my fellow apes, because you're in for a ride. Let's together explore the primary answers given to the primordial question, and along the way expose some brutal brute facts. When I was 12 years old, I was lying in bed one night, and suddenly I had this thought, what if there were nothing? John, the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Peter, the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is perhaps the most fundamental, deepest, most difficult question that I can conceive of. Quentin, if there is any question that has haunted me my entire life, it is, why not nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Richard, when we think of why there is anything, why is there something rather than nothing? Why anything at all? Why not nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? Mario, why is there anything at all? Why is there anything at all? I want to know why there is anything. Steve, why is there something? Anything, rather than nothing. Good question, good sir. Well, after reacquainting myself with a couple of books and papers on metaphysics, and watching endless hours of Robert Lawrence Kuhn asking everyone, including the postman, why is there something rather than nothing, I've come to the conclusion that I often come to when considering both philosophy and science. Sean Carroll is, yet again, the creme de la creme. His communication on this question, by my lights at least, is second to none. He's considered this question in a few places, such as on his blog and in his podcast, that I highly recommend of course, but one of his most thorough deep dives is his phenomenal contribution to the Routledge Companion to Philosophy of Physics. I am in fact going to use the structure of his essay as a template, and so should the wonderful professor ever see this video, cheers, good sir, I owe you a pint or two. The question of why the universe is the way that it is goes back as far as we have records, but despite the brilliance of Aristotle, Aquinas and Averroes, it wasn't until the 18th century that Gottfried Leibniz took us a step further, by asking, why is there something, rather than nothing? Echoing Aristotle's unmoved mover, Leibniz argued that God is the reason why the universe exists, but that God's existence is his own reason, since God exists necessarily. So let's get some key terms on the table. Consider this beautiful mug that's full of freshly brewed coffee. We can ask, why is this mug full of coffee? Well, there's a multiplicity of answers we can give, such as that it's my mug and I like coffee, or because I just walked into the kitchen and poured coffee into it, or even that I have a very healthy and personal relationship with caffeine. And if we want to get a bit more abstract, we could say that the mug is full of coffee because we're allowed to exchange money for goods and services. Or, as Carol states in his podcast, we could say that it's because space-time is four-dimensional, or that gravity is attractive. Yeah, Mr. Carol. Yes, science! With all of these answers, we're entertaining an explanation or reason for the fact that this mug is full of coffee. 
And further still, we're explaining the fact by referencing other facts. Thus, if those other facts didn't exist, then neither would my mug of coffee. In philosophy, these types of facts are known as contingent beings, which as the Stanford Encyclopedia expresses, are entities that exist but could have failed to exist. My mug of coffee is a contingent being since, for instance, if we wasn't allowed to exchange money for goods, then I almost certainly wouldn't have this mug at all. And note here that a being in philosophy can mean just about any existing thing, be it a concrete entity, a proposition, a relation, a state of affairs, possible worlds, numbers, and so on. But what about our ability to exchange money for goods? Is this a contingent being? Yes, it is, since if we didn't desire goods, then we wouldn't have created currency. Okay, what about our desire for goods? Is this a contingent being? Yes, it is, since if we didn't need external resources to survive, then we wouldn't desire goods. And so on and so on, either ad infinitum, forever, or until we land on a non-contingent being, a being that could not have failed to exist. These entities are known in philosophy as necessary beings, and despite what some proponents might have you think, they're controversial, to say the least. Hume, Russell, Hawkins, and indeed Carroll reject them, but we'll expand upon this in chapter 3. So, when Leibniz said that God is a necessary being, what he was saying is that God could not have failed to exist, that God exists in all possible worlds, that it's impossible for God not to have existed. Now, you might be thinking, if we're going to assume that a necessary being exists, could we not just say that the universe itself is necessary, that it's impossible for the universe not to exist? Yes, you can, and in such a case you wouldn't be additionally committing yourself, like Leibniz, to an unembodied mind, who really, really hates flamboyant apes and shellfish. Oh, yeah, and despite being all loving, explicitly endorses slavery in his good book. But we'll get to God a little later. First, let's deal with some other non-answers. Given the laws of physics as we understand them, it's quite plausible, and in fact, our universe has the characteristics of a universe. If you were going to create a universe from nothing, it would have the characteristics of the universe we live in. Within his essay, Carroll categorizes the potential answers to the question of why is there something rather than nothing into five broad candidates, and immediately after introducing each, he distinguishes between two similar sounding but fundamentally different questions. The first question is, why is there stuff? Why is there anything inside the universe rather than just empty space? And the second question is, why is there space at all? Why is there anything that we would recognize as a universe? Refusing to beat around the bush, Carroll states, clearly it's the second question that most people have in mind when they ask why is there something rather than nothing. But answers to the first question, which are much easier to imagine obtaining, have often been passed off as relevant to the second. For instance, when Krauss says, If you were going to create a universe from nothing, it would have the characteristics of the universe we live in. He is passing off an answer to the first question as if it's relevant to the second. Now, don't get me wrong, if an empty quantum space, a vacuum, will spontaneously create particles and space-time bubbles, then this is phenomenal in its own right. But since a quantum vacuum is something, this is not, and cannot, be an answer to the primordial question. In essence, it states, the reason why there is something rather than nothing is because there's something, a quantum vacuum. Thus, this is a non-answer. Another candidate that Carroll considers is a principle. That is, there might be something special about the way our universe is, which we could then point to as a reason why it exists. The universe might be, to give a few examples, the most beautiful, symmetric, or minimal. I mean, to be fair, the historical trend of science has been to explain complex phenomena through simple principles, has it not? Carroll gives the examples of Newtonian mechanics unifying a multiplicity of physical phenomena, Maxwell's electromagnetism unifying electricity, light, magnetism, and radio heat under one theory. Darwin's natural selection unifying all species under one single history of life on Earth, and Einstein's general relativity unifying the three dimensions of space with time under space-time. Perhaps, then, at base, there is an ultimate, single, unifying principle that we can one day hope to discover. This would no doubt scratch our existential itch, but would it really answer the primordial question? No, it wouldn't. In essence, it would answer the question of why is there something rather than nothing by saying that it's because there's something, a principle. Thus, this too is a non-answer. And yet another candidate that Carroll considers is the metaverse. 
Perhaps a collection of truly distinct realities, non-interacting, not stemming from a common past, not necessarily with the same laws of physics, wherein all possible states of affairs, all possible worlds exist, and we happen to live in one where there's a lot of somethings. The problem, of course, is that in addition to this being ontologically expensive, I mean, we'd have to assume the existence of an infinite number of other universes, this supposed answer doesn't, in fact, provide an answer. In essence, we'd be asserting that the reason why there is something rather than nothing is because there's something, a metaverse. Thus, this too is a non-answer. Hence, the primary lesson here is that many of the most prominent supposed answers to the primordial question reinterpret the keywords of something and nothing in a way that effectively avoids the question. But even if we were to be maximally charitable and allow such an interpretation, all we would be doing is kicking the can further down the road. If we say that the answer to why is there something rather than nothing is because of a quantum vacuum, or a principle, or a metaverse, then the immediate question that follows is, why is there a quantum vacuum rather than nothing? Or, why is there a principle rather than nothing? Or, why is there a metaverse rather than nothing? And how is one to answer these questions? It seems to me that there's only really one option, a brute fact. All roads lead to Russell. Why is there some quantum vacuum rather than nothing? There just is. Why is there a principle rather than nothing? There just is. Why is there a metaverse rather than nothing? There just is. It has no explanation. But what if instead we say that it's necessary that there's a quantum vacuum, that the universe itself is a necessary being, or that God is a necessary being, or a principle, or what have you? Does this prevent us from having a brute fact in our worldview? Well, Let's find out. A contingent being is a being which has not in itself the complete reason for its existence. That's what I mean by a contingent being. You know as well as I do that the existence of neither of us can be explained without reference to something or somebody outside us, our parents, for example. A necessary being, on the other hand, means a being that must and cannot not exist. To reiterate Frederick Culperston's words, you know, as well as I do, that the existence of a given thing within the universe has not in itself the complete reason for its existence, or in other words, that it's dependent on other existing things, and thus is contingent. Well, I say that you know, as well as I, but if you're a necessitarian and are convinced that everything couldn't have been otherwise, then, of course, you'll reject contingency outright. Alternatively, you might reject the very notion of necessity outright, and in such a case you'd be in very good company, sat alongside the likes of Hume, Kant, Russell, Hawkins, and indeed Carroll. Yeah, as you might already know, or won't be surprised to hear, this field of philosophy is controversial, to say the least. Some philosophers believe in a necessary being, whereas others don't. Replying to Copleston, here's why Russell chiefly rejected the notion of necessary beings. I would say that what you have been saying <clears throat> brings us back, it seems to me, to the ontological argument that there is a being whose essence involves existence, so that his existence is analytic. That seems to me to be impossible. And uh, it raises, of course, the question, what one means by existence? Uh, and as to this, I think a subject named can never be significantly said to exist, but only a subject described, and that existence in fact, quite definitely, is not a predicate. In his critique of pure reason, Immanuel Kant undercut the ontological argument by maintaining that existence is not a property, but rather that which instantiates properties. What, we can ask, is the difference between this brown mug and this existing brown mug? Well, adding the word existing here doesn't do anything, does it? To be brown or even a mug, it must already exist, and so to say that something has a property is to presuppose its existence. So, in a nutshell, Russell rejected the notion of a necessary being since it defines something as having a property that is not, in fact, a property. As far as Russell was concerned, the claim that God exists is a synthetic statement, requiring empirical evidence. One can't just define God to exist. Now, there's much more to unpack here, but this isn't the place nor time to do so. I'd have to dedicate an entire video, and more likely a series, to adequately deal with the various arguments for, and objections to, necessary beings. But I do think it's worth emphasising that 1. There's plenty of people who reject the category of necessary beings, and 2. Unless we have extraordinary reason to accept the category of necessary beings, we really shouldn't. 
I mean, to go back to the question of why am I making this video, what would you think of me if I said that the reason I'm making this video is because it's impossible that I don't make this video? That is, that it's necessary that I make this video, that I make this video in all possible worlds. I, for one, would find this answer equally as absurd and unsatisfying as a brute fact. Many, and theists especially, are quite happy to create an entirely new category of explanation, but I have to say, I'm not so inclined, but I do have a few books to go through in the following months that might sway me. However, let's tentatively place all concern aside, as our purpose here is merely to question whether or not this would, indeed, satisfy the primordial question. You know, you imagine some explanation of the entire cosmos. Uh, as you rightly say, it would have to be something which, as theologians and philosophers say, has a necessary existence. It must be it's self-sufficient, it's got to be its own cause. Now, people sometimes think that's God. God is his necessary existence, it is his own cause, and so on. Um, I think David Hume gave the right answer to that, which is to say, we don't know what anything could be like that has that property, except possibly numbers, but then whether they're things is a, <laughs> an issue. Um, so if you, if you want a necessary existence, why not, why not think of the whole world, the cosmos itself? as necessarily existent. It's got as much a claim to be necessarily existent as anything else you could imagine. For example, a mind or creating intelligence. Uh, theologians try and get around that by saying that God is causa sui, his own cause. Okay, well, let's suppose the world is its own cause. If you're happy with the category of things that cause themselves, that's your explanation. <laughs> and we see the universe and <laughs> yes. we don't see God. <laughs> exactly, yes. As Simon Blackburn said, if we're happy with the category of things that cause themselves, then why not say that the universe is necessary? Why should we say that the universe is contingent, and then suppose that there's something additionally outside of the universe, such as an unembodied mind that is necessary? Why postulate an extra thing? Or as Carol puts it, all else being equal, a self-explaining and necessary universe would be a simpler overall package than a self-explaining and necessary creator who then created the universe. Well, the primary argument that's given by theists as to how we know the universe as a whole is a contingent being is due to the fact that everything within the universe is a contingent being. This, however, is a fallacy of composition, as Hume and Russell correctly identified. Well, why stop at one particular object? Why shouldn't one raise the question of the cause of the existence of all particular objects? Because I see no reason to think there is any. The whole concept of cause is one we derive from our observation of particular things. I see no reason whatsoever to suppose that the total has any cause whatsoever. I can illustrate what seems to me to be your fallacy. Every man who exists has a mother, and it seems to be your argument is, therefore the human race must have a mother. But obviously the human race hasn't a mother, that's a different logical sphere. Again, this topic is deserving of its own series, but if we suppose that there's a necessary being, say, the universe, then have we really escaped a brute fact? If when you ask, why is there something rather than nothing, I reply that it's because something is necessary, have I really answered your question? No, I haven't, since after kicking the can down the road, the immediate question becomes, why are there necessary beings rather than nothing? And note here that my question doesn't pertain to a necessary being in and of itself, but rather the set of necessary beings, which would be a singleton if there's only one member. Why is it that there are some things that explain themselves rather than nothing? On the one hand, if we say that the reason why there's some necessary beings rather than nothing is because it's necessary that there's some necessary beings rather than nothing, then we're both rendering the set as a member of itself, and we're not actually answering the question, since a necessary being is something, not nothing. And if we say, as most theists do, that it's just the case that there is a necessary being, that it's a brute fact, then we've now committed ourselves to two costly ontological prices. You see, for me, the entire appeal of a necessary being is predicated on Leibniz's promise that it ends the infinite regress, that it will answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? But since, on analysis, it doesn't actually answer the question, the appeal, for me at least, is no longer there. But whether we suppose a necessary being or not, it's clear, I would argue, that all of the proposed answers to the primordial question are, in fact, non-answers. They all presuppose something, be it a quantum state, a principle, a metaverse, or a necessary being, which all in turn either end in a brute fact, or worse. Alright, let's recap and wrap up. 
In the first chapter, we define two forms of explanation, with the first being contingent beings, which are entities that exist but might not have existed, and the second being necessary beings, which are entities that exist and could not have failed to exist. In the second chapter, we examined some of the primary answers given, including a quantum vacuum, a principle, and a metaverse, and concluded that these are, at least ultimately, non-answers, since they are all something. In other words, they all state that the reason why there is something rather than nothing is because there's something. Finally, in the third chapter, we unpacked the notion of a necessary being, considered a few objections, and concluded, or at least I concluded, that the answer of a necessary being, even if one exists, is also a non-answer to the primordial question, since a necessary being is something. If we refrain from answering the primordial question, then we technically avoid a brute fact. But as incredibly frustrating as it might be, all of our most promising roads lead to Russell. Anyhow, before signing off, I just want to plug the muck. If you'd like to support the channel to support me in my quest of seeking truth and exposing those who pretend to have it, then please do consider becoming a patron or YouTube member. It really does make a difference, especially with the channel not doing so well with views lately. And with that, thank you kindly for the view and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and YouTube members. Much love.